it. His body broken for Remember his appeal. He gave his life to save us so. I searched the earth for something that could satisfy A peace for the hurt I had buried deep inside Knees on the floor, I finally found everything I needed You lifted my soul and opened up my eyes Chasing after what won't last I'm done with building these castles That crumble like sand
the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into Darkness tries to roll over my bones. When 
sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross you have won me with your kindness you chased me down when I was lost where would I be if it
Good morning. I, I greet you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome, welcome. It's great to see you. It's a beautiful, beautiful day to be together and to worship. So I, I just want to extend that word of welcome. And I especially want to welcome our guests this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, those present, those online, we are delighted that you've chosen to be with us. And, and it's our hope and prayer that you experience the, the grace and truth of our Lord in this service and among God's people today. So welcome. I have a few uh, announcements I want to make. And number one is that, um, you know, today is September 11th. And on this day, we will remember what many of us um, will never be able to forget. We'll never be able to uh, forget the events that happened uh, so many years ago. And so there's a video you'll, you'll see later. But uh, we want you to know as we move through this this service that that is certainly on our hearts and minds and we will remember this together also want to uh, just say a word about our small groups the signups are still available and you can see the sign up out um, as you exit the worship center this morning the grief share group will have an information meeting on Tuesday at 6 30 p.m. and that's in the good news class and then on Wednesday uh, two classes are are going um, Rick Hanning will be leading Why Am I Here? It's a study based on the Purpose Driven Life um, book, and that's in the administration building. You can talk to Rick about that. And then I have our class, we call it Prayer in the Word. It is often called the Text of the Week, where we study the scripture that I'll be preaching on the coming Sunday, and that's in the parlor. And both of those classes start Wednesday at... Um, um, 6 p.m. so be mindful of that also want to give you some upcoming dates that are part of our discernment process you probably received an email hopefully you did if not please let us know but these are upcoming dates upcoming discernment meetings September uh, Saturday September 24th Wednesday October 5th and Monday October 17th so please put those in your cal on your calendar and um, we will um, move towards those dates. 40 days of prayer. Uh, hopefully when you entered, you received this uh, week one um, prayer guide. We are, as a congregation are praying together as we move through this season of discernment. And uh, please, please uh, take this with you. Uh, each day there is a scripture and a, a, a a devotional thought and a time of prayer and so uh, you're invited and we hope that you do um, use this during these 40 days of prayer booklets uh, will be at the back table if you did not uh, if you didn't get one when you came in and also there's there are other announcements on our bulletin and be sure to make note of those but it's great to see you here this morning and uh, want to invite our band to, to lead us in worship let's stand and sing together this morning Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on a Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun, we look to the sun. Salvation tearing through the dead of night. See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light. Freedom shaking up the atmosphere as the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears. Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, see His 
first happened. The minutes felt like hours. The hours felt like days. And the horror of what happened, one detail after another, could hardly be processed, much less understood. Then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into years. Memorials were built. Wars were fought. Victims' names were read. Survivors tried to pick up the pieces over and over again. But no matter how much time has passed, we vow to hold these memories. We will never forget those who were taken from us. The world changes and shifts this way and that. But one thing stays constant. One thing is steady. God. God weeps with us. God mourns with us. God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. He is closer to you than your own breath and remains the cornerstone of life. God is the solid ground holding us up as the world moves beneath us. It's as true today as it was on that day. Our God reigns. He reigns over principalities and powers. His dominion stretches beyond what our eyes can see. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God reigns. We will always remember.
as the video was playing, I was reminded of, um, and pardon me for this because I was not prepared for it, but I was reminded of my devotional reading. I think it was yesterday morning, and I'm reading through the Bible in a year, and I have an Old Testament and New Testament reading. Well, this, the Old Testament reading comes from Lamentations. And in chapter 3 of Lamentations, Jeremiah writes of his lament. And he speaks about um, the affliction that he has felt and the hardship and the suffering and the adversity and all that goes with that. And then, and that goes on and on. But then in verse 22, the tone of Lamentations 3 changes. Uh, it changes from I have no hope and I have no peace to this and since we're not doing our normal affirmation of faith this morning maybe maybe this is our affirmation of faith on September 11 the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end they are new every morning great is your faithfulness the Lord is my portion says my soul therefore I will hope in him the Lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul who seeks him if you affirm that will you say amen, amen. let's pray together our father we bow before you this day and we pause on this September 11th to remember and it's not even hard to do that throughout this day we will see news stories replayed and hear testimonies we are reminded of the darkness and the world in which we live and yet oh God your love is steadfast and our hope is in you we believe that and we say that and we we affirm that together today you are worthy of our worship because you are indeed faithful and true forgive us for our sins forgive us when our fears and doubts and anger forgive us for the ways in which we take our focus off of you and we try to do life our own way have mercy we pray we are ever in need of your mercy and your grace so we choose now to to repent to let go and recognize you as Lord of our lives we return to you and we receive the mercy and grace that you have for us we love you and we choose to follow you today and to trust you Lord we are grateful for all that you've given us above all we are grateful for the gospel the word of life that meets us right in the midst of our despair it's the word that you O oh Lord Jesus have come to bring life and life in abundance the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you, O oh God, are the giver of life. And we believe that. We stand on that truth. We, we bring to you the concerns of our hearts this day. We, we pray for our nation. Lord, we pray that where wounds are still so raw that you would bring healing, and we entrust it to you. And, we pray that you would bring healing to those who even years later still continue to mourn and grieve we pray that you would give us faith to trust you through it all we pray for our nation we pray Lord for the world at large and such a big prayer as that but you're a big God and nothing is too hard for you you love the whole wide world and so we commit it to you now we pray for 
grace and mercy. We pray for justice and righteousness. We pray for grace and truth. And we also lift up your church and our congregation. We commit your church to you. You're the head. And so we surrender to you. And we pray for our own needs. Lord, you know everything about us. You know us better than we know ourselves. And so, Lord, we commit our lives to you, all of our struggles, all of our worries, all of our doubts and fears, and everything. We commit them to you, entrusting it to you and praying in faith as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing together again. Oh, 
Our children are invited now if they would like to go to Children's Church. Miss Jane is waiting for them at the door. You guys have a, a great Sunday morning during Children's Church. And as, as they go, let's, let's pray. Let's pray for them and pray for the, the remainder of our time. Lord, thank you for those children. Thank you for our children. In so many ways, they represent the best in each of us, and we are grateful. And we pray that as they go today, they will hear once again your word of grace and truth, how much you love them, your call upon their lives, your call upon their lives, all of our lives, to serve you, to love you, to love one another. We pray for those of us who will remain in this room as your word is read and preached, God, let it be a, a faithful preaching. And I pray that what I say will be what you want me to say. And I pray that I will say it in a manner that is honoring to you. And should I be unclear or misspeak, Lord, may your Holy Spirit clarify for each of us what you need us to hear. We praise you, we give you thanks, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, as we, again, just continue working through this, this book. We're going to read verses 11 through 20, and it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's a, a strange passage, to be sure. Here we go. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. And then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists 
undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and pre prevail mightily. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lessons abound everywhere. Everywhere. It's been said that we can learn something from everybody. Sometimes it's learning what to do. Sometimes it's learning what not to do. But for most everybody we can learn some kind of lesson I think we can learn something from every circumstance as well every circumstance we find ourselves in and I'm trying to remember that in my own life so recently when I find myself in a situation that seems perplexing or challenging I, I've paused I've caught myself a couple of times before I before I go into doubt or whatever, I, I caught myself thinking, okay, Lord, what are you trying to teach me in this moment? What is the lesson that is here for me at this particular moment? There are lessons to be learned in our text this morning. I think we'll learn lessons from these men. They are called the sons of Sceva. But we'll also learn lessons from the larger story that surrounds them. So a quick word of context is important for this text. This is Paul's return trip to Ephesus. He first visited Ephesus as he was concluding his second missionary journey. Now he is on his third missionary journey and he stops back in Ephesus. And this will be the place where he spends the longest time. He will spend two years in Ephesus and develops an incredibly close connection to the Ephesians and to the elders of that church. Chapter 19 begins with Paul arriving in Ephesus and he asked them this question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? So they are believers, but they did not understand the Holy Spirit. And so he explains it to them. He baptizes them in the name of, uh, in the name of Jesus. A and suddenly the Spirit of God descends upon them. They are filled with the Spirit. And this event is sometimes referred to as the Ephesian Pentecost. So it's at this particular moment we, we know that he's in Ephesus. This is what has been going on, this awakening, this spiritual revival, if you will. It's important to note something about the city of Ephesus. And I want to stick to my notes here because this is an important note about this city. First of all, it was an important city. It was a center of travel and commerce in what was known as ancient Asia, not to be confused with modern day Asia. This is Turkey, is what we're thinking about today. It was situated on the Aegean Sea at the mouth of the Castor River. It was one of the greatest seaports in the world. The Temple of Artemis, dedicated to that goddess, is considered one of the seven wonders of the world, and it was in Ephesus. The city had a theater with 25,000 seats. 
and this large, large market in the city. It was also known for its practice of magic. Now, history and archaeology records magic scrolls, rings, amulets, books with incantations and spells coming from Ephesus. Now, we need to be clear. When I talk about magic today, we're not talking about sleight of hand, fun, illusionary tricks. We're talking about magic from the dark arts, the dark arts that are connected to evil spirits. And this gives light, really, to Paul's words in his letter to the church in Ephesus. We call it the letter of Ephesians. After he, uh, sometime later when he writes to the Ephesians, remember these words from Ephesians chapter 6. So he's writing to the people later where he is right now. This is what he says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul's ministry in Ephesus was a threat to the paganism expressed through the worship of false gods, but it was also a threat to the paganism of the practice of magic. And so that's the setting that Paul finds himself in at this particular moment. So let's learn lessons from the sons of Sceva. First of all, God is a miracle-working God. God is a miracle-working God. Back to the text. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Now pause there because there's this wonderful redundancy. The word miracle itself implies something extraordinary. But Luke puts a modifier on the word miracle. He says it's an extraordinary miracle. I mean, it's like, it's, like, it's, it's a miracle, but it's, it's not like every other extraordinary miracle. There's something special about these miracles. And he tells us what it, they, they were. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. No doubt, that, that's an extraordinary kind of miracle, Right? Um, it's believed that what, what happened is that Paul, they took the, the handkerchiefs or the headbands, sweatbands that Paul would use when he was working or the apron that he would use as he was tent making or whatever. And if those pieces of clothing touched his skin, they would give it to people. It would be carried to those who were diseased or demonized. The diseases would come out and the demons would flee. I mean, that's an extraordinary kind of miracle to be sure. It's extraordinary. It's not totally unique, though. I mean, we think about a passage in the Gospel of Mark where a woman touches the cloak of Jesus, the cloak of Jesus, and you remember, she is healed. And earlier in Acts chapter 5, it says that when the shadow of Peter would fall upon someone, that person would also be healed. So this is an extraordinary miracle, not totally unique, but definitely extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, back to the point, though, the focus is that it is God doing this miracle. It's not Paul. It's coming through the hands of Paul, but it's God. And it just reminds us of the, the point I'm trying to make is that God is a miracle-working God. He truly is and we often say that just kind of theoretically knowing it. But to really embrace that God Almighty, the God we serve, is a miracle-working God. In our Bible study last Wednesday, several of our members expressed times where they felt that they had experienced a true miracle, a working of God that couldn't just be explained by normal explanations. And I suspect that some of you, maybe many of you could say the same thing, that you've had times in your life or the times in the lives of people you know where the hand of God moved and it was extraordinary. It was a miraculous event. We believe this to be true and yet it's because, I think, this is just my opinion, I think it's because we believe that God is a miracle working God that when God does not do what we hope he would do, when the miracle does not come, when the breakthrough does not happen, it's because we know God can do it and he doesn't do it. That's when our faith begins to struggle. That's when I find myself going, God, you could have, but you didn't. I'm reminded of the words of Lauren Daigle, the song, Trust in You, and I love these words. She says, 
When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could go through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. And I think that has to be sort of our posture, our response, that when God does not move the mountains, he's still a mountain-moving God. Maybe not in this moment, maybe not in this season, but he is still the God who moves mountains. And so perhaps you are needing an extraordinary work of God in your life, in your family, at work, at school, whatever. May, may, I, may, may I remind us all that we serve a God for whom all things are possible. We serve a God for whom nothing, for, in which nothing is impossible for him. And may we have the courage, and boy, I put my name right up there. May I have the courage to trust him with the results of that prayer. Because God is a miracle-working God. We learned this lesson from the Sons of Sceva incident. But second, we see that the name of Jesus must be revered. It must be revered. So I want to begin with this acknowledgement of the reality of evil spirits and demonic forces. There's no way to come through this text without acknowledging that. And there's really no way to not acknowledge that as we read the entirety of the New Testament, the Gospels as well as the Epistles. And so let's jump back to the text and think about uh, uh, these realities. First of all, starting in verse 13, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now pause there for a moment because I found this incredibly interesting. I, I, I discovered from scholars that the, the, the itinerant exorcists were common in the ancient world and the most respected itinerant exorcists were actually Jewish people. I found that fascinating because they are the people of God, but somehow over the centuries, their their faith in the Lord God Almighty, their faith in Yahweh gets assimilated or integrated or mixed up with the paganism in the world in which they find themselves. And, And they were actually the most respected, probably the highest paid itinerant exorcist. And notice what they're doing. They take the name of Jesus that Paul is using And they use it for their own gain by by attempting to use the name of Jesus to cast out steam uh, spirits in other people. They they don't even know Jesus, right? Not personally. It's just like, you know what? If the name Jesus works for that guy, then surely the name Jesus should work for us also. They're using the name of Jesus like a tool, like a hammer, just to be bandished or or bandied around and, and used as a carnal instrument. Keep reading. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. So, so pause for a moment. Um, Sceva is referred to as a high priest. Don't think of him as the high priest in the sense of the high priest in the Gospels. You remember in the Gospels, we often read of this high priest. That's the highest ranking priest in ancient Judaism. Most scholars think that this phrase, a high priest named Sceva, This was a self-designated title, like an advertisement. Hey, I'm Sceva, and I'm a high priest. Well, his sons, and there were seven of them, they attempted to do this, to use the name of Jesus to uh, cast out evil spirits in people. But, verse 15, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize But who are you? Now, pause there. In my mind, I imagine this being a very maniacal, diabolical-sounding voice. If, If we didn't even know the rest of the story, I bet all of us would go, it's going to go bad from here. (laughs) If we didn't even have the rest of the story, I bet every one of us would go, I don't know how this story ends, but it's not going to end well for these guys. And it does not end well at all for them. And the man in whom the evil spirit was the evil spirit, he leaped on them, mastered all of them, 
overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. The strength of this evil spirit is seen in this one man who overtakes masters, beats up, and leaves humiliatingly naked these seven sons, these seven other men. Wesley writes about the ludicrousness of trying to just use the name of Jesus for self-gain and profit. I love these words. He writes, vain undertaking. Satan laughs at all who attempt to expel him either out of the bodies or the souls of men, but by divine faith. His craft cannot be known but by the Spirit of God, nor can his strength be conquered but by the power of faith. F.F. F. Bruce says it like this, but when they tried to use it, Jesus' name, like an unfamiliar weapon wrongly handled, it exploded in their hands. So they try to use Jesus as um, just a, a tool, a, a carnal tool, if you will. Um, they, they use his name sort of as a, as, a, as a token, but they have not bowed their own lives to the lordship of Christ themselves. They know nothing about him. And the point is that the name of the Lord must be revered. In verse 17, following this particular incident, we read this, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. The name of the Lord Jesus must always be revered. It must never be used as a tool or as a carnal weapon to promote selfishness, selfish agendas, or anything that is contrary to the kingdom of God. The name of the Lord Jesus, however we use it. And I would su suggest that even if we have a, a little fish symbol on our car, that's using the name of the Lord Jesus, right? whatever. That when we use the name of the Lord Jesus, we always remember who he is and our lives must yield to him. I think about the opening line in the Lord's Prayer, and I pray this prayer daily, and this is convicting to me every time I pray it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The very first line of that prayer is, Lord, may your name be kept holy. May your name be kept holy through me today. And so a question that I need to ask myself is, Lord, is my use of your name keeping your name holy? holy am I as a, as, a, as a professed follower of Christ am I using your name in a way that is contrary to the kingdom of God it's a strong lesson from this story about the sons of Sceva the name of the Lord is to be revered but third believers relinquish what needs to go you know sometimes things just need to go. So let's go back to the text. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of them all, and they counted the value of them and found it that it came to the number of 50,000 pieces of silver. I mean, what an incredible scene this is. Those who had, who had already come to faith uh, earlier in the chapter, they are now coming and they are confessing. Here's the reality, and it's, it's the reality that all of us face who call ourselves Christians. Oftentimes we find ourselves with one foot in Christianity and another foot in something that's not, right? I mean, we are a, a mixture of commitment to Christ, but also we are torn and tempted by the draws of this world. And so they find themselves... Christian, but at the same time still kind of having one foot in the other kingdom. And they come confessing their sins. They come confessing their sins. And not just confessing their sins, it says they're divulging their practices. Now, we, we could easily just kind of read through that, but scholars say it's more than what you probably think it is because the, the power of magic was believed in the secrecy of the magic. There's power by keeping the spells and the incantations and all that kind of stuff secretive. 
And when they are divulging all of this, it's like they are giving away the power. They're just, not only are they confessing sin, they're like emptying themselves of it. They're giving up the power. And notice what they do next. Those who had these books of magic and so forth, they come voluntarily and they burn them. Now, this is not a book burning compelled by the, you know, the higher powers. These are just voluntary people who go, i got to get rid of this. There's something in my life. I know the Lord Jesus, and this is not pleasing to him, and this is not helpful to me. And so they bring these books, and they burn them. And I want you to note the value, uh, 50,000 pieces of silver. I read somewhere this may be like $6 million in current currency. I mean, this is, th- th- this is something very valuable, and they're saying nothing is more valuable than Jesus. Nothing. Nothing, nothing is more valuable than Jesus. I read that, I'm like, that, it's incredibly inspiring to me. We too need to be able to relinquish. I love this statement about Daryl Bach writes. He says, the fact that this becomes evident to those who already believe shows their growing maturity in the faith. They did not appreciate this when they first initially responded to Jesus, but now they see it. So they did not give up the practice first and then became Christians. Rather, in their maturing walk with God, they came to renounce the practice, no doubt through the spiritual guidance and enablement that the gift of the Spirit brought. So these believers are being discipled. They are growing. They are maturing in their faith. And the evidence of that is they're willing to relinquish and let go what needs to be let go of. And we too, I think, I don't, know about, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I know there are things in my life regularly that I need to relinquish. And I think the call is that we must be willing to surrender anything and everything in our lives that keeps us from being faithful to the Lord being willing to surrender anything and everything in our lives that hinders our walk with the Lord. We've all heard the statement, everything in moderation. Let me tell you, that ain't always good advice. Because there are some things, even in moderation, that will destroy you. And the call is to be able to relinquish and and, and continually repent, retin- continually turn to the Lord and say, Lord, hey, I picked it up again. I need, to, I need to keep burning it, quote, burning it over and over again. And so the question that I ask myself, and you can listen in as I ask myself this question, is there something in my life that needs to go? Ed Lance, is there something in your life that needs to go, that you need to let go of, that your walk with the Lord may be more faithful and more true. One writer, and I cannot remember who it was, but he speaks in this uh, specifically about, you know, spiritual forces of darkness. And he talks about what he calls landing spots. And he says, there are things in our lives that just allow the evil forces of darkness to kind of land in our hearts and work on us. He likens it to garbage and how garbage attracts rats. He says, there are things in our lives There are things in our lives like uh, flirting with darkness or unrepentant sin or damaged emotions. These are the things that allow the forces of darkness to kind of land and get into our hearts. Dr. David Siemens years ago wrote a book that is a classic. It's, It's an old book, but it's a classic book called Healing for Damaged Emotions. And and Dr. Seaman's point is that Satan works in those wounds of our hearts. When our hearts have been wounded and they've not been healed, the enemy takes up residence in those particular spots. And so is there something in our lives that just allows the enemy to exploit and manipulate anger, bitterness, Fear, pride, selfishness, sexual immorality, greed, abuse. I pray that I, I pray that all of us will have the courage 
to do the work and let go of or relinquish whatever we need to let go of so that our walk with the Lord will be more faithful. Number four, the word of the Lord triumphs. It triumphs. Verse 20 is a summary statement, one of several that we find throughout the book of Acts where Luke summarizes the growth of the church and the spread of the gospel. Listen to this one. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This is a significant statement in the context of Ephesus because at Ephesus, at Ephesus, magic was considered to be the prevailing power. And what Luke is saying, what this whole scene is saying is that, no, it is the gospel. It is the word of God, not magic, not the dark arts, not the kingdom of darkness. It is the word of God that prevails. The word of the Lord triumphs, and I believe this with every ounce of my being the word of the Lord triumphs certainly this was a part of early Methodism when asked what may re- what may we reasonably believe to be God's design in raising up preachers called Methodists Wesley replied to reform the nation and in particular the church to spread scriptural holiness over the land. And that's the belief and the call of the church throughout the centuries and across the denominations that the word of God triumphs over the word of darkness. The word of light triumphs over the word of darkness. The word of life triumphs over the word of death. And may the word of God triumph in my life and in your life and in all of our lives. May you, may I, may all of us find victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that is a matchless name for any and every circumstance we find ourselves in. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you and we pray. And As our band comes forward to lead us in our final song, we give you thanks and we praise you. Speak to us, Lord. Give us courage to trust you in all that we do. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen. So if you would like to pray about anything as our, as our band leads us, you're invited to come. I'd, I'd be honored to pray with you. Um, yeah, so band, thank you for what you do. And if you will lead us now, would you stand? Could not hold you, the veil 
out or before you silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roar, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no this this final word with you as as a benediction the word of the Lord triumphs the word of the Lord prevails believe that trust that if, if you need help in our areas and find people who can help you work through that but know this God will send you to the right place the right people trust his word go forth in the name of the one whose name is matchless matchless may we have the courage to let go of what we need to let go of and trust in his prevailing word in our lives go forth in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord amen and amen see you next week
the stars.